Hi, this is Pastor Bob. Today on our broadcast, Dealing with the Healing Lamb, we're going to talk about authority in two worlds. You know who noticed it? The centurion said, you've got authority in a world I'm not familiar with, but I understand authority. You just speak the word from here. My servant will be healed. And Jesus marveled at this man and his simple understanding of the power of God. Let's go to the word of God today and find out about our authority in the name of Jesus. For more than 40 years, Bob Yandian has been an expositor of the Bible making seemingly complicated doctrine easy to understand. Grab your Bible and something to take notes with and study the Word of God with Pastor Bob Yandian. Hello, welcome back and welcome again to Student of the Word with Pastor Bob Yandian. We are continuing on with our series on the healing lamb and today is number five. I'm teaching on the authority we have in two worlds. And the two worlds are the spiritual world and the natural world. And of course, we know what natural world is. We carry authority here. You know, authority doesn't mean you run the company, okay? The guy that runs the company gives you authority in a certain area to do. And you don't have to ask their permission. That authority was given to you. You know, if somebody comes to your house and wants you to sign up for life insurance, they're from some big company, and, uh, you know, you're wor- and they're there talking to you, and you finally say, okay, okay, I'll take it. He says, will you sign here? And he says, I'll sign here. And when he looks to you, he says, you are now covered. All right. The, the president of the company didn't say that. This man said this. This woman said this that are selling you that insurance policy, but they have authority to do so. You might say, well, how do I know that's just your word? Well, I can tell you this has been given to me. And when I exercise this authority, it will come to pass. And so the same thing is true in the spiritual world. The one that understood this was the centurion. We'll talk about him today. And we've kind of gone through the chapter here of Acts chapter eight. We're going to go back and kind of review some things that we've taken up in these chapters because there's so much in this chapter. We're going to talk about it and uh, that we've been given authority from the Lord Jesus Christ. We've been given authority to lead people to Jesus. Did you know the moment they confess Jesus Christ as Lord and receive him as their savior, the moment that happens, we can tell them you're on your way to heaven. Now that's, that's a big chunk to tell somebody. And somebody might say, well, how do you know that? You know, you're not Jesus, you're not God, but I can tell you this, that authority was given unto me in the Great Commission to go and, and bring people in the kingdom of God. And, and we're told in Romans 10, 9 and 10, that that's the simple plan of salvation is receiving Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior. So by doing that again, you can be guaranteed you have eternal life. And you know, you can't go to heaven because Bob told you that. You go, you go to heaven because you know God told Bob that to tell you that my authority came from God himself. And so that's the beauty of what we have. Let me quote to you again, Acts chapter 10 and verse 38. While you're finding that, the book that I'm offering on this broadcast is The Grace of Healing. And this uh, particular book takes up healing from the aspect of God's grace. Our faith is mentioned in this book, but since most books deal with our faith, I really wanted to write one that dealt with God's grace because grace comes before faith. Anytime in the word of God, there is nothing for your faith to receive without God's grace. And so Abraham experienced that. He received the Lord as his savior and uh, David received the Lord as his savior. We received the Lord is our Savior, and so many benefits are given to us from the full hand of God that all we do is reach out with an empty hand and and receive from God. So that empty hand represents faith. The full hand represents God's grace. So that's what this book is all about. It'd be a great blessing to you. It really covers it up, uh, covers the whole area of healing from the goodness of God, not just us receiving from the Lord. And so Acts chapter 10 and verse 38 says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil. It says God anointed him. This is God gave him that authority we're talking about today. And Jesus Christ had that authority when it came to dealing with sickness and disease. When it came to seeing people receive him as savior, he could call them sons and daughters of God, part of the family of God. And that's what we're talking about here. Let me give you kind of a small outline of Matthew chapter eight. In verses one through 17, Jesus shows his authority over sickness. In verses 18 through 27, Jesus' authority over over nature, he stills a storm. In verses 28 through 34, Jesus' authority over demons. And so let me give you a breakdown of Matthew 8, verses 1 through 17, with three healing miracles mentioned there. In verses 1 through 4, we have the healing of the leper. So Jesus heals an incurable disease. The man was a Jew, he's a man. 
He's a castaway from society. Jesus healed him by touching him. Boy, that was a brave thing to do with the people standing around that saw this happen to touch a leper. Jesus heals him by touching. And the next of all, Jesus healed him right there at the spot. That's important because the one we're dealing with today is the next one. That's the centurion's servant in verses five through verse 13. And so the centurion was a very wealthy man. He was a Roman and this was his son that was being healed, calls him a servant, but he was really a son in the family. And this is a Gentile, a Roman. And the boy that's being healed is a boy, a young boy. This is an aristocrat. Jesus heals him by speaking, but Jesus also heals him from a distance. Then in verses 14 and 15, we have Peter's mother-in-law and Jesus heals a fever here. And she's a Jew, she's a woman, a housewife. Jesus heals her also by touching, he touched her hand. And then next of all, Jesus heals her there at the spot. So we have a, a, we have a Jew here, the leper. We also have Peter's mother-in-law were healed right there on the spot. The centurion's servant was healed from a distance and Jesus commended this, this centurion for his faith. And the reason why was he said, listen, you, we're just gonna stand here. You speak the word Jesus over there. I recognize authority. And Jesus was so impressed with the man. He told his disciples, I haven't found this kind of faith in my own home country, in the people I was sent to, in the religion that my background comes from, and that is Judaism. He says, I haven't found that kind of faith here. And so Jesus marveled at this man's faith. So today, again, we're taking up the centurion's servant. Let's take a look at verses 5 through 13 here in Matthew chapter 8. And again, while you're finding that, the book that I'm offering, I failed to mention it, is that at halftime, when we uh, come to the uh, break in the uh, broadcast, you're going to be able to buy that book and you'll find out what a great blessing it is. And this should be one of the most important parts of your library. Again, the simplicity of the healing that comes from God. Let's take a look here in Matthew chapter 8, verses 5 through 13. It says, And when Jesus entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion beseeching him, saying, Lord, my servant lies at home, sick and paralyzed, grievously tormented. Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof. Now, this is not a false type of humility. He just understands I've got the Son of God. He understood him. Man, he called him Lord. Lord is a term for his Messiahship. This is a Lord... For the, this is a word that indicates he is the one we've been waiting to come on. And I am a Roman, but I've accepted you as my savior. And you're, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof, but you speak the word only and my servant will be healed. For I am a man under authority. I have soldiers under me and I say to this man, go and he goes to another, come and he comes and to another servant, do this and he does it. And Jesus heard it. He marveled and said to those following, truly I say to you, I have not found such great faith no, not in Israel. There's only a few that Jesus remarked as great faith, and uh, this is one of them. I say to you that many shall come from the east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom will be cast into outer darkness. There'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus said to the centurion, go your way. And as you have believed, it will be done to you. And his servant was healed in the same hour. I want you to notice something here again when this man came and, and, and Jesus commented for his faith. This man said, I'm a man under authority, but I also have men under me. Authority is always a sandwich. I mean, very rarely are you the one that sits at the top. You're the top piece of bread up there. No, you're somewhere the meat in the middle that gets so much done here, but you also understand authority that as it works from that which is above me to me, it also works from me who are above others down to them. And so this authority works in that direction. He says, I understand that. He says, and I've been watching you in ministry. I've been probably, I've been standing with the crowds over here watching you. And one thing that's sure of is you understand authority. You are under authority. You're friend of the father, but also what's under you is sickness and disease and Satan and demons. All these are under you, and I recognize that I don't have authority in that world. You do. I have authority here in the Roman Empire. I do with the military. I do with the government, but I do not have the authority you do. But you know what? I recognize that in you. And listen, I know one thing. All I have to do is speak and things get done. And I don't even have to be there. I can speak it. And the word gets out to my troops. The word gets out to my uh, servants and they do what I ask them to do. Now I'm telling you, I understand that in you. So I'm just gonna stand back and listen. If you'll speak the word from here, my servant will be healed over there. And Jesus said, wow, I haven't found this kind of faith. Let me ask you this. Do you have that kind of faith? 
Or do you have to be one of those saying, no, 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 I've got to be there to lay hands on them. Now that's true if you're near them, but I want you to understand something too, that you can speak the word from here. The prayer of faith in chapter 12 of the book of Acts delivered Peter in prison. They were praying at the church and Peter in prisons over there and suddenly, an angel appears by him. Suddenly, the angel just reaches down and the chains fall off. And the, the and the angel says, put your shoes on, put your coat on. Come on, we're going out of here. And they walked and all the doors opened up as they were going. I mean, all the doors were open, led right to the street. And when they finally got to the street, Peter looked around. The angel was gone, but he realized something. He said, huh, he was asleep. I mean, he was still half asleep as he walked out of there and he was going to be killed the next day. You have to truly be resting in God to do that. But as he stood there in the streets, he suddenly realized he'd been delivered. Went to see the, the, the prayer meeting because he understood there was a prayer meeting going on and a girl came running to him at the, at the gate. She said, yes. And he said, I'm Peter. She said, no, you could be Peter. He's in prison. We just started praying for you. And she was shocked at how quickly he was delivered. There's the power of simple authority. There's the power of simple faith. Faith works by authority. And Jesus said, in his ministry to his disciples, I give unto you authority over all the power of the enemy. Two Greek words. He says, I give unto you authority, exousia, over all the power, dunamis of the enemy. Satan has power, but we have authority. Authority is greater than power. A policeman standing at a corner whenever the lights are out, you know, the, the traffic signals, he raises his hand in this direction, stops them. He tells this group to come on through, and then he puts his hand up here and tells this group to come on through, meaning you stop, you go, you stop, you go. And he doesn't have power over the cars. I mean, the smallest little motorcycle, moped coming through, has more power than he does. He doesn't have power over the power of the car. He has authority over the power of the car. And that way, authority means he can stop semis or he can stop the smallest Toyota coming through the intersection. But either way, a Toyota could run over him and kill him. And especially that truck could run over him and kill him. But he, he raises his hand like this. What happens is because he carries authority, all the power stops. But what is it behind authority? It's power. God demonstrated his power at the cross. And it's by demonstrating his power at the cross, he doesn't give us the power from heaven. He gives us authority to use that power. He gives us that exousia. And we stand there with Satan. We don't have the power to cast out a devil. I'm not more powerful than a demon. One demon, the smallest demon, is more powerful than me. But I can raise up my hand and use the name of Jesus. That police says basically stop in the name of the law. He is representing the law. He's using the law, but he is not the sergeants. He's not all those above him. And here's what happens. If those cars don't stop, if they don't yield to his authority, they're going to face the power behind his authority. And that means wreckers. That means dogs. That means everything. We're going to get them out there. And we're going to catch this guy because you've resisted the authority. What I'm saying is if Satan resists your authority, he doesn't want to face the power again. He faced it at the cross and he lost. Now he backs off when we use the name of Jesus. That's the authority we have in the name of Jesus. What, this is great stuff. This man recognized that in Jesus. We'll come back and right after the break, we'll continue on with the story and talk about your authority in the name of Jesus. How much faith do I need to be healed? In The Grace of Healing, Bob Yandian answers this question and reveals the missing ingredient to the healing you've been praying for, grace. Throughout church history, the doctrines of grace and faith have been taken to separate extremes as they relate to healing. The result is that many believers struggle to receive healing from God. Those on the side of grace deny the need for faith, believing that God only heals a select few. For those who only see a need for faith, the pursuit of healing becomes a legalistic struggle to change God's mind. Pastor Bob takes a different approach with practical biblical teaching that balances both elements of grace and faith. You'll find the healing you've been waiting for when you find the missing ingredient of grace. To order The Grace of Healing, visit bobyandian.com. Basic doctrines are not difficult, but easy to understand. They often become disguised as complicated or deep sounding words, but the definitions are simple. Pastor Bob makes complex theological concepts clear and practical. Eight crucial doctrines of the Christian faith are demystified. Redemption, justification, sanctification, reconciliation, predestination, election, 
propitiation and glorification. These eight precepts, essential for all believers to understand, come to light as you read and arrive at a deeper understanding of the finished work of Jesus Christ. To order Theology Simplified, visit our website at bobyandian.com. Bob Yandian Ministries is training up a new generation in the Word of God. Because of your generosity, this teaching ministry is able to change countless lives. You will never know until you get to heaven how many people received Jesus, were filled with the Holy Spirit, healed, or found God's will for their life through your support and prayers. If you would like to become a partner with Bob Yandian, visit bobyandian.com and click on Partnership. The Word of God tells us that Jesus marveled at this man's faith and commented to his disciples, I haven't found this type of faith, no, not in Israel. I had to find it from a Roman, but from a centurion who understands authority. He basically said, I wish my people understood authority. I wish my disciples understood authority. They came back shouting and rejoicing that the demons were subject to them. Like, wow, it really works. Jesus basically said, of course it works. I've given you that authority. Notice again, they didn't conjure up the authority. They didn't create the authority. It came from Jesus who received it from his father and passed right on down. And so that's what we can do as Christians. We take the great commission and we also understand that authority. And guess what happened? Just like Peter was delivered from prison while they were praying for him at the church, it says that his servant was healed in the self-same hour. At the very time Jesus spoke, within that hour, this servant was healed, this son was healed. The centurion called Jesus Lord. This is, again, an indicator of his understanding. And the Greek word for Lord is kurios. is where we get Jehovah from, from the Old Testament. Lord is the New Testament title for the Old Testament title, Jehovah and showing he was a believer. Somewhere back there, he saw the Lord, received him as Savior, and understood this guy operates in a totally different realm than I do. Well, yes, he does, but he also gives you that authority that, he, that Jesus carried, and he gives it to you also. You have it today. Understand the moment you get born again, receive Jesus as Savior, and especially when you start using your uh, gift of tongues that you receive when you were filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking with tongues, you begin to understand that authority God's given to you. I didn't conjure up the authority. I didn't get it. All that God did was give it to me and I received it and I use it. It still came from God. It's God's authority, but Bob operates in God's authority. And so the word Lord or Kurios recognizes his deity and he recognized in this this soldier recognized Jesus as the Messiah of Israel. Religious leaders didn't call him Lord. The uh, Sanhedrin didn't call him Lord. The Jewish leaders didn't call him Lord. The rabbis didn't call him Lord. They called him teacher or rabbi because they could not believe that this guy was really Messiah. So they would not call him Lord, though the crowds did, his disciples did. And even this Roman called him Lord. The centurion was a nobleman, a leader in Rome and in Israel. And I think he, he did demands a greater respect for the word nobleman. He was incredible. He had nobility about him in his leadership, but a love for people, a respect for people. In fact, in another translation in Luke, we'll take a look at that. It says he's even built us a synagogue. Man, this guy cared about the things of God. Again, the centurion recognized authority, knowing importance of men above and below. He knew God was above Jesus and sickness was below Jesus. And the centurion had authority in this world, Jesus had authority in his world, but God has given us authority in his world when we receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, and we understand that authority, have confidence in it. The servant who was at home sick was actually paralyzed. Paralutikos is the word, which means we get the word paralytic from that word. The man was not only saved, he had enough time to grow in grace. This is the Roman centurion. And when the centurion called on Jesus, he knew he was able to heal. When Jesus came to the house, he demonstrated his willingness to heal. Jesus demonstrated this to the man and told the leper. We're going to find out Jesus actually got close to the house before all this happened. And in Luke chapter seven, I want to take a look at what Luke had to say about this very same story. And what's interesting, because see, people grab this, say, oh, it contradicts Matthew. It contradicts Matthew chapter eight. So see, the Bible is, now we're going to talk, take a look at it because we're going to quote another verse of scripture that pulls these two stories together. In Luke chapter seven, let's take a look at verses one through 10. Now, when he had ended all of his sayings in the audience of the people, he, that's Jesus, entered into Capernaum. And a certain centurion servant who was dear to him 
him, was sick and ready to die. And when he heard of Jesus or heard that Jesus was there, he sent to him the elders of the Jews. Notice this, it doesn't say the man came himself. He sent the elders of the Jews beseeching him, he would come and heal his servant. Now it says, and when they came to Jesus, they besought him instantly saying that he was worthy for whom this should, he should do this. These men are defending and they're trying and really preparing the path for him. He loves our nation. He's built us a synagogue. Then Jesus went with them. And when he was now not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him saying to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself. I'm not worried that you should enter under my roof. Neither do I think myself worthy to come to you, but you say in a word and my servant will be healed. We find out that Jesus didn't say it from a long distance away. He followed the servants to the house and just as they got there, the centurion sent out another servant and said, no, no, don't come in, speak the word from here. For I am a man set under authority, having soldiers under me. I say to one, go and he goes to another, come and he comes and to my servant do this and he does it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him, turned around and said to the people who followed, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, no, not in Israel. And those who were sent returning to the house found the servant whole that had been sick. So we don't set ourselves under authority, but we're set under authority by others. I didn't set myself in this position. I received Jesus and he set me in this position. Jesus was amazed at this man's understanding of authority and mentioned his great faith. One other person, Abraham, was called strong in faith. This man is said of the same thing. I want you to understand, these, you say, yeah, but it seemed like these stories contradict. It doesn't just seem like it. They do contradict until you can find out the truth behind it and the story behind it. And what the story is in John 13, 20, listen to what it says in John 13, 20. Truly I say to you, who, he who receives whoever I sin receives me. And he who receives me receives him who sent me. Here we go with the double authority. Jesus here and God the Father above him. Now we have sickness below him. John 20 and verse 21, Jesus said to them, peace be to you as my father has sent me, even so I send you. What are we saying in, this, in these verses of scripture? When, when Jesus got there, and the centurion sent somebody out, he received the person who was sent out as if he was receiving the centurion himself because he was. When you come in the name of another, it's as if that person came himself. When Jesus sends you out, whoever receives you receives Jesus. Whoever receives you receives God the Father who sent the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you understand what I'm saying? These two stories do not contradict because in the first one, it said that the man came out there, the centurion came out there himself when he didn't, he sent representatives. But when Jesus received the representatives, they received the centurion. When the centurion saw him coming, he sent somebody else out and Jesus was still receiving the centurion and marveled at this man's faith, but really marveled at the man's understanding of authority. I guess we come back down to this. Remember, there was, a, there was shows years ago. I remember when I used to watch television as a child, I love the part where the policeman came to the, to the door and knocked on the door and said, open in the name of the law. They might open up and it could be Barney Fife standing out there. Now you have to remember Mayberry, Barney Fife and all these things back there in that show. And remember Barney Fife was just a, a scrawny guy. He was the, he was the uh, sheriff's deputy. And so being the deputy, he would go out and do the work for the sheriff, but he only had, he was, he was so bungling that the, you know, that the sheriff only gave him one bullet. He carried that in when he got into a situation, he stick that bullet in there because the guy didn't want him, the sheriff didn't want him blowing his foot off because that's how clumsy he was. But he'd become the door and he had this, this high attitude of himself, which made him look worse. It'd been better if he was like this centurion that just, you know, came with a good calm attitude, understanding his authority. But anyway, Barney, the one I'm talking about was proud of his authority. But he'd knock on the door and say, open the name of the law. So many programs did that. Dragnet, other ones, they'd knock on the door and say, open in the name of the law. You're not opening up the name of Bob. Whenever I come and deal with Satan, Satan, you're not dealing with Bob. Bob has come in the name of Jesus Christ. To receive me is to receive Jesus Christ. To hear me speak is to hear Jesus speak because I'm speaking the word of God and Jesus Christ is the word of God. When I speak and say, Satan, come out of that woman. Demon, come out of that man. When I say those words, that demon has to obey me there. Now, they're like a spoiled brats once in a while. They'll scream and yell, and go, no, 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 I don't want to do that. But they understand something. They have to come out. 
You know, there's times when my kids, I was going to tell them, listen, this, it's gone too far. You're going to get a spanking. No, 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 no. But they understood it. When I said it, it was going to come to pass. And so they could fight all they want to. And demons will often fight. Sickness sometimes. You tell it to leave. I remember one story one time about Smith Wigglesworth and a lady brought her demon-possessed daughter to her who had been dealing a lot with witchcraft and things like that. But a demon did it in her. And so uh, she brought, him, brought the girl to Smith and Smith just, you know, laid hands on her, commanded that demon to leave, and he left. Well, it was an hour later. That girl was still writhing under this demon. So the lady called him on the phone and said, Smith, you commanded this demon to leave. It's still there. It didn't work. And he said, I said, it has to come to pass and hung up the phone. The lady turned around. Her daughter was completely healed. What am I saying? That he spoke the word. And even though it took an hour to come to pass, many of those who Jesus prayed for spoke the word of God over. It says within the self same hour. So again, sometimes it took some time. Maybe many of them were longer than that. I've had people in church I prayed for. There was no change in a couple, three days later. And suddenly the person and their parents or whoever was there called said, there's been a tremendous change today. The doctors are amazed at what's gone on. I personally don't care how long it takes. Sickness has to respond to the name of Jesus. Now, there may be some other indicators in there. There may be some other factors in there that keep the person from even being healed at all. But I can't read a person's heart. But if that person's heart is right, if the people bringing have the right attitude, and I use the name of Jesus in faith, that combination means that person is set free. And so again, I come in the name of Jesus. Again, John 13, 20, I say to you that whoever receives, whoever I send receives me and he that receives me receives him that sent me. That's exactly what the centurion had said. I am a man set under authority, having soldiers under me, but I have those above me. He said, I understand something. You understand authority, Jesus, because you've been sent. There's somebody above you that gave you that authority. I'm simply asking you to exercise that authority for me. And I recognize that because I I have two or three levels above me and I have levels below me. I'm in the middle of the sand, which called authority. So are you. But the beauty of it is you look up toward God where your power comes from, your authority comes from, but you look down on demons. In fact, when Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law, it said he rebuked the demon and the word rebuke means to speak down to. It's not the fact that Jesus was up here, the demon was down here. Physically, it simply means that by authority, Jesus was here, the demon was underneath him. And when Jesus spoke that, uh, over the fever, it had to come to pass. John 20 and verse 21 is the words that I have been sent out on in my ministry as my father has sent me, even so I send you. You say you've been sent from the father? Yes. You've been sent from Jesus? Yeah. Well, which one? It came from Jesus who got it from the father. These signs shall follow them that believe in my name. There's that authority. You'll cast out devils, speak with new tongues, take up serpents if you drink any deadly thing. It shall not hurt you. You'll lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. 2 Corinthians 5.20 says, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you on Christ's behalf, in Christ's absence, in his stead, be reconciled to God. This is the great commission given to us to lead people to the Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks for tuning in today. I'll see you next time. You can order resources, become a partner, or browse free articles and podcasts. You can also join our mailing list and receive weekly devotions and the latest ministry updates. Visit bobyandian.com. To contact us by mail, use the address on your screen. Thank you for watching today's broadcast. We'll see you next time on Student of the Word with Bob Yandian.